Good morning and welcome to church here this morning. Welcome to this place of worship where we can honor the Lord with our hearts and minds and voices and bodies. I want to remind the kids that you are welcome to use the ribbons and banners and your voices and your bodies to dance so that you are part of worshiping the Lord as well. And all of us remind the same thing. Worship with our hearts, our minds, our bodies, however God impresses upon you to show and demonstrate your worship to him. I pray and hope that you can live into that. And um, why don't you stand with me this morning as we begin our worship. God is great, and he is powerful, and he has done marvelous things, and he will continue to do marvelous things. You come. 
presence, Lord, and you are enough. Right now, we're going into a newer song. I believe we've done it once before, a long while ago. And this is a song about how God is enough. He is enough for us. Jireh. Jireh means our provider. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Just enter into this and sing as much as you can and listen and allow your hearts to realize that he is enough and we can be content with him and we are enough in him. Never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Going through a storm. But I won't go down I hear your voice Carried in the rhythm of the wind To call me out You would cross an ocean So I wouldn't drown You've never been closer Than you are right now
with beauty and splendor. How much more does He clothe you? How much more does He clothe you? If He watches over every sparrow, how much more does He love you? How much more does He love you? more than you ask, think or imagine, according to his power working in us, it's more than enough, more than you ask, think or imagine, according to his power working in more than enough it's more than enough it's more than enough truly love us he does 
just sing that song again this morning. Turn your eyes. Lord God. Lord, we want to look fully upon you. Lord God, may our eyes, may our hearts, Lord God, just look and meditate upon who you are. God, when we get a glimpse of who you are, when we get a glimpse, Lord God, of your glory, when we see you, Lord God, in the rightful place, Lord God, you are the King of kings. You are on the throne. You reign on high. Lord, the situations, the circumstances, the, the things that we go through, Lord God, in light of your glory and grace, Lord God. We do not fear. We, we do not get troubled, Lord God. We, we have a peace that the world doesn't give, Lord God, but a perfect peace that comes from the Father. We, we have a joy despite the circumstances. We have a hope, Lord God, where things seem hopeless. You give us strength when we are weak. All of these promises, Lord God, that in, in our perspective, in our lens, Lord God, when we see things through our eyes, it, it doesn't make sense. But God, when we turn our eyes upon you, when you give us, Lord God, your eyes, your heart, your Holy Spirit that shows us and reveals to us, Lord God, the heart of the Father, then, Lord God, we begin to see that you are able. We begin to see, Lord God, that you are stronger. We begin to see, Lord God, that you are righteous. You are holy. You bring us through and you bring us past all the things. Lord God, I pray right now for so many circumstances and situations, Lord God, where people just need a healing touch from you. Lord Jesus, we call out to you. We call out to you, Lord God. You are the great physician. You are the healer, Lord God. And you are able to do so much more than we can ever imagine. God, we pray even as we were singing just a few moments, Lord God, we ask for your provision, Lord God. Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, Lord God, you are our provider. You give us, Lord God, what we need according to your riches and glory, Lord God. I love, Lord, as in Matthew, Lord, well, why do we have to fear, Lord God? You take care of the birds of the field you, or of the air, Lord God. You take care of the flowers of the field, Lord God. And, and yet, Lord God, we get anxious. We worry, Lord God. Lord, may we seek you first. May we seek first, Lord God, the kingdom of God and your righteousness. Your righteousness, Lord God, and all the things that trouble us, Lord God, will begin to fade. As we see, Lord God, the kingdom perspective, may we walk in tune and in line, Lord God, with you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And God, that gives us a heart to understand the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is moving in power. Lord, may we be able to be a part of that. Holy Spirit, we ask that you just continue to move in power in this place, Lord God, through your word in our kids' ministry this morning. God, may every heart and mind, Lord God, just be in tune with what the Spirit has. Holy Spirit, I invite you again, Lord God, to just speak through me, Lord God. Use your word and make it go forth in power. Lord, we thank you. You are holy. You are righteous. You are good. There is no one like you. Lord, we thank you in your precious name. Amen. We want to welcome you this morning to Glad Tidings. If you're new with us and if you're old to us or if you've come for a while or come for all your life, welcome. Uh, welcome online to those who are watching online. And uh, we just look forward to what God has in store for us today. Uh, I want to make a special announcement before we make, do the announcement reel this morning. But uh, Carol McKinnon, I can't see her right now. There she is. Um, you turned 90 years old this week, and we want to just be able to uh, appreciate you, and thank you. <laughs> and uh, maybe during our greeting time today or during the fellowship lunch, just 
let's uh, give her our well wishes, and, and I'm glad that you are part of our family here. And then as well, uh, I want to welcome, it's hard to see with the lights sometimes, but Elizabeth and Layla and the, the boys and Layla is here as well this morning, so we welcome her, just a couple of weeks old, so welcome to our family, and <laughs> welcome to the church, Layla. Uh, why don't we stand, why don't we greet each other briefly today? We're going to keep it a little shorter because after the service we do have our fellowship lunch, but why don't you greet each other, and I'm going to uh, let the kids go at this time. I forgot to do the announcement reel. Wait, sorry, 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 I forgot. Let's watch the announcement reel first, and then we'll greet each other. I'm jumping ahead. <laughs>
So the uh, baby shower next week for baby Layla will be right after uh, the service. And it's not just for women, it's for families. And it won't be long, so men don't feel that you're going to be ours. Um, so those that are going to stay, just bring a snack of finger foods. We'll share, have a quick little uh, finger food lunch and, uh, and present some gifts to this new little baby that we're so happy that's part of our congregation. So I just wanted to clear that up. Thank you. Awesome. Sorry for the confusion again. Why don't you greet each other, if you haven't already, for a couple minutes, and then if there are any kids remaining in here, then I'll dismiss you off to Kids Church. Sorry about the confusion. All right, we're going to get back into, uh, into the service, back into uh, God's Word here this morning in just a moment. I'll just mention as well, maybe you heard it in the announcement reel, but uh, the shoe boxes, you probably saw them as you were coming in this morning. But uh, if you still have any outstanding shoe boxes, you will have till 2 p.m. today to get them in to here. <laughs> All right, we're continuing through. Today is the very, or not the last of our sermon series, but we are going into the last fruit of the Spirit this morning in our series on becoming. This series, A, if you're new to us or if you're just tuning in for the first time, we are looking at becoming more and more like Christ. We are looking at what the fruit of the Spirit, what the Spirit of God does in our lives to make us look more like Him, to, to make us look and show the characteristics of God through our lives. And so this week we're finishing up with the actual fruit of the Spirit and we're looking at um, the list that we have before us. Hopefully you know it off by heart now, but love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And then this morning we are looking at self-control. And then next week, we're going to finish up this series with talking about that last part of the scripture. There is no law against these things, or there is no limit. There is no boundary to the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And we've been going on this journey together to look at becoming more and more 
of who God made us to be, to become more like Christ. And I think it's been a good journey so far. I feel like as we're going through this series, as we explore and we examine the fruit of the Spirit, God has been doing a work in my heart and my life, and I hope He has been doing that for you as well. That as I examine and I filter, I said that on one of the first weeks, but as we look at this mirror, do we like who we're becoming? Do we, do we like the characteristics that we see and that we show to the people around us? And I know that there are times where I look at how my life looks, and it's not always the same reflection of Christ. And so we're becoming more and more like Christ, and that's our desire, that sanctification, Christ making us more like Him, but it comes with our submission, it comes with our dependence upon God. And so this morning, I want to look at self-control. Out of the discipline of the Holy Spirit to empower us to do the right things and to not do the wrong things and to give us the drive and the desire and the motivation to do or not do what God has called us to. For the first few moments this morning, I want to look at one of the, another letter, not Galatians, but I want to look at the book of Colossians for a few minutes. And I want to talk about self-control because if you can attest, self-control is not always easy. It's hard for us to do at times. It, it was hard for the church in Colossians as well to do. And so we look into the book of Colossians, and we see that it was difficult for that church as well. Because Paul lets us see, it and he's instructing, he's bringing some correction to this church. He gives us a couple of things that were going on in this church. Maybe some wrong thinking and some wrong patterns that began to enter people's lives. And it was a product of this. There was kind of these two parties that began to, to come up. Number one, there was this group of people who were like, man, self-control is so hard. It's so difficult. So what we're going to do is we're just going to remove every sort of temptation. Where we're going to just resist everything that, that might tempt us. And so we're going to just withdraw. What we're just going to hide in. And then this thing called asceticism was entering in. And basically what that would be is, if I gave in, if, I'll use a, maybe a silly example, but if suddenly I have this craving for, for chocolate cake and I gave into it, then if I gave in to my temptation, then I would chastise myself. And they would even hurt themselves, beat themselves. They would punish themselves. They gave themselves these rules upon rule upon rule, just saying we can't touch, we can't go near to, to the point that they weren't really even living in freedom. I mean, we do need boundaries. We need guards over our heart. We need to, to resist temptation. But yet to the place where they weren't understanding grace. They weren't understanding the full life that the Spirit wants them to have. And so we had this one camp over here. And then we had this other camp who was like, self-control is really difficult to do. So we're just not even going to try. You, you know, Paul was talking about Jesus, and, and Jesus brings us grace, and so I might as well just give in to every sinful, every sinful temptation. I'll just give in to my impulses. I'll just do what I want to do, and I'll, I'll satisfy the desires of my flesh, and, and grace will cover that, right? That, because that's what Jesus came for. But no, Paul, Paul brings correction to this church and saying, no, that's not what self-control is. Self-control is difficult. It is hard sometimes to resist temptation. It's hard sometimes to do the right things or resist the wrong things. But yet this is where the Spirit of God does His work. This is where there's the difference, as we've been saying, as, as kind of the, the foundation of this message series, is it's not self-improvement, but it's spirit empowerment. It's not just about me trying to discipline myself and keep myself in line and not do wrong things. Or it's not about me just saying, well, I just throw in the towel. I'm just going to do whatever feels right because this is too hard following God. And so it's spirit empowerment, not self-improvement. It's not self-discipline in the sense that I have to do it on my own. But the fruit of the spirit, the spirit of self-control that he wants to develop and mature in our life comes out of a complete dependence, a complete reverence, a complete understanding that I cannot resist sometimes. But greater is he who is in me. That, that I can learn to put to death my sinful nature. I can learn to take into submission the things that tempt me and I can bring it 
under his lordship, that I can invite the Holy Spirit to take control. And so, here were the two camps that Paul was writing to, and where we read in the book of Colossians. And Paul was just saying, well, we need to take a little time out as a church, because there's this spiritual fruit called self-control, and it comes when we abide, when we're fully filled with the Holy Spirit. It comes, I know that it's difficult to resist sometimes. I know self-control is not easy to do at times, but this is where God does his best work. His grace is sufficient. And it's a spiritual fruit, the Spirit of God, the Lordship in our lives, giving Him full access, full submission. That's how we have self-control. And so before we go back to speaking about the fruit of the Spirit, I want to look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. And you might see, as we put it up on the screen, you might think, well, what does this have to do at all with the fruit of the Spirit? Or self-control. But, but I want... Follow with me, and I hope that we can get there this morning. Paul writes this picture and gives this picture of what a life that is self-controlled, what it's under submission to Christ looks like. He he says, let me give you a picture of my life that is submitted to Christ, what self-control looks like, and here is what it looks like. He says this, he says, devote yourself to prayer. So a life that is self-controlled, that is self-disciplined, that is in, in submission to Christ is devoted to prayer. It's devoted to being watchful and thankful. Paul says, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains. A picture of self-control here is that the fruit of the Spirit in action in someone's life is suddenly going to be not about me. It's not about my desires. It's not about what I want. And Paul is saying that as you come into the fullness of the Holy Spirit, then suddenly you're concerned about things like devoting yourself to prayer, being watchful, getting the message of of the gospel to go forward. Instead of getting caught up and wrapped up in myself like the church in Colossians was doing about whether I can do this thing or not do this thing, or if I do this thing, then I'm beating myself, or the other camp who was saying, well, I'm just going to, satisfy every desire, Paul is saying, well, you've lost perspective. We just sang that song a few minutes ago, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And Paul is saying, when your focus is on you and whether you can or cannot or do or do not, you've made it self-indulgence. Your self-control is about the self. But what would it look like if suddenly the filter of your life is about, Holy Spirit, how do I honor you? How do I bring forth your message? How do I bring you glory in everything that I do? Am I being watchful? Am I being thankful? Am I, is that my heart's desire that, that the doors will be open for God's message to go forth to proclaim the mystery of Christ? And Paul says, for that I'm in chains. Paul was under control of the Spirit, not his own desires. Well, we see this evident because no one among us would voluntarily want to be in chains, be imprisoned for our faith. But there was something greater in his perspective. His lens that he looked through was far greater than himself. It was about the gospel message. And so he says, listen, a picture of self-control is that you are radically wrapping your life into the message and the mystery and the beauty of taking the gospel to places it needs to go. A self-controlled life is a purposeful life. It's a life that understands that it's not about me. It's about the call. It's about Jesus. It's about bringing forth his message. It gets the focus off of me and my sinful nature and my sinful desires. And suddenly it gives me a purpose that I actually want to honor God in the things I think about, the things I do, the things I watch, the things I indulge in. It's about the self-control because I'm not controlled by myself. I want to submit to Christ. He has reign in my life. We talked about that last week with the horse, giving him reign and giving him the reins of our life. We need to live out of a purpose. We need to live intentionally. And so in verse 4 and 6 of this, as he keeps going, he says, pray that I proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make most of every opportunity. Let your conversations always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. 
He, he says part of self-control is understanding it's about others. It's about the gospel. It's about serving one another, not about serving myself. And so we could sit around and just say, well, I'm just not going to sin. I'm just going to self-motivate and self-discipline myself. I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to sin. I'm going to be self-reliant. I'm going to be self-controlled. And it's about me doing it. Or we could sit around like the church in Colossians and we could just say, well, I'm just going to do whatever I want and His grace is sufficient. His grace will cover all my sins. And we can get kind of lazy with our faith. But biblical, true biblical, spirit-filled living, spirit empowerment and self-control is being able to live fully. John 10.10 says He's come to give life and life to the full. We can live fully, but not for ourselves. We, we can live fully but not satisfy the desires of my sinful nature. But I walk in the Spirit. I, I walk according to His ways. I walk to honor Him. I live my life to honor and reflect His glory. That because I'm becoming more and more like Christ. It comes out of this purpose that we actually understand and we're inviting the Holy Spirit. Show me who I'm truly made to be. And, and that's totally different than this worldly view, this self-centered view of self-control. Paul says this in a different way elsewhere. He says to clothe yourself. He says, I want to put this calling on you that you clothe yourself. You, you make the intentional decision that you're going to take off of the things of the sinful nature. You're going to put on Christ. He says this in Ephesians 4. He paints it like this. In verse 22 of Ephesians 4, he said, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by de deceitful desires. Right? He, he is saying that you understand your sinful nature. You understand that, that our natural impulses are, are the things that we want to be controlled by. We need to put those aside. We need to die to those things. That we don't miss the mark, but we want to be all that God has made us to be. We want to become who he's called us to be. He continues to say in verse 23 and 24 of Ephesians 4, he said, you put off these deceitful desires to be made new in the attitudes of your minds. To put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. It's not about self-improvement. It's not about me just saying, well, I want to be self-controlled so that, so, so that I don't do these wrong things. It's saying, I want to be self-controlled because I am no longer a slave to the sin. I want to be a slave to Christ and His ways and honor Him with all my thoughts, with my mind, with my browsing, with my viewing, with my attitudes towards my family. It is self-control for His namesake so that He may be glorified. And Paul is saying, hey, I, I need you to know, I know we're figuring out this self-control thing. But, but you really we need to understand that it's not about self-effort. I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but I really want that to be the pulse of our heart that a year from now, months from now, as we look back and we reflect upon what the Holy Spirit has shown us through this series, that we understand that when the temptation comes to try to self-improve or try to do things on our own strength, we quickly grab hold of that lie and say, no, it's not about me. It's not about how I just need to do better and try harder. It's about surrendering to a holy God who makes me more and more day by day into his image. It's about spirit empowerment. And so not about just trying real hard to, to resist but trying so much that we wrap our whole life, our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole soul, our whole being into God, may you be glorified. May you be honored through my life. Not on our own, but by being in step, filled with attentive and surrendering to the Spirit of God. And this is what he calls his church to be. He, he, he says that I'm coming for a pure bride without spot or wrinkle. He calls us to be holy as God is holy. And when we really grasp that, when we really begin to meditate on that, that is a very high standard. And I think, especially in our culture nowadays, in 2023, almost 24, that we sometimes have lost the understanding that to be a disciple of Christ means that I need to be disciplined. 
I need to bring myself into submission to the ways of Christ. I can't just live sloppy. I can't just live according to whatever feels right that day. He's coming for a pure bride and that heart's desire, the drive, and that's what the Holy Spirit gives us is actually this motivation, this desire, this desperation. God, I want to be more like you. I, when I wake up in the morning, I want my day to honor you. When I, when I interact with my coworkers and with my family, I want to be more like you. And that comes with discipline. That, that comes with submitting to the Holy Spirit. Not myself, but him be glorified. And so it comes with this mission, with this purposeful living, intentional living. If you've been part of the Grow Character course, if you've taken it here, you're, you're going to hear some of these same things overlapping. But this is what it's about. It's about growing, developing, maturing, being healthy, being mature in Christ. I, I would be sad if my eight-year-old and five-year-old child just stayed at that age. Sometimes I wish. I'm like, I think they're growing up too fast. I'm like, you can just stay this age forever. But at other times, I also look with anticipation. Wow, as they're growing, as they're maturing, as they're suddenly learning new life skills and they're growing, there's something amazing about that. And in our spiritual lives, we cannot get stagnant. We cannot plateau. We cannot resort back. But we set our eyes, we set our focus, we set our, our goal on something that is far greater than me. And that gives me the motivation to, to want to be self-disciplined. It's spirit-filled, discipled living. We can't do it on our own. That's not how we're created. So, so as we examine, as we look at this idea of self-control, I, I want to present to you a, a study, maybe you've heard of it before, but in the 1960s, a Stanford professor by the name of Walter Michael did an experiment that's probably largely known. And what he did was he took four and five-year-old children and he brought them one at a time into this room and he sat them down on a table where on the table there was one marshmallow, one marshmallow on the table. And he said, okay, I'm going to make you a deal here. You can have this marshmallow if you want. If you want to just eat it, it's yours. But if you could just wait 15 minutes, if you could show a little self-control, if you could wait 15 minutes, then I'm going to come back and you get two marshmallows. The choice is yours. And they understood all the conditions of, the, of what was presented to them as he left the room. They kept a camera on the room to see what the kids would do. And it was really funny to see what would happen because some of the kids right away just grabbed it, boom, and ate it. Other kids, they, they kind of like toyed with it a little bit. They sat there. You could see kind of that agony in their face. Like, should I or shouldn't I? Or, oh. And then some of them, it took a few minutes. And then they ate it. So, some began to just pick at it and think, well, maybe that's not so bad. And they began to just taste it. But I'll, I'll leave, leave the marshmallow alone. But then there were those who, who were disciplined, who, who showed the self-discipline, and they waited the 15 minutes, and they were given a greater reward. And the biggest part of this experiment wasn't just about the marshmallows on that day, but what was amazing about this is that they actually tracked and studied these kids for, for years to come as they grew, as they matured, as they became teenagers, and then adults. And... The results maybe even surprised the researchers because they found that the kids who could resist the temptation, who could settle for just leaving the one marshmallow alone and waited and then got the two, they were actually more successful in everything they possibly could do. That They were lower in their drug use, upon alcohol use. There was a group who, who were lower in obesity. They had better social skills. They, they were able to have better education or discipline themselves in education. Their SAT scores, this was American, were higher than those who, who instantly grabbed for satisfaction. It, it seemed like the secret thing to, to success in every measurable way was simply this one thing called self-control, which is both fascinating and discouraging in some ways because it kind of confirms a lot of ways which we live sometimes. Or maybe we think, well, self-control is just something we're born with 
or not. And we talked about that last week, about our nature. Maybe it's natural to you to just want instant results, instant satisfaction, instant, I'll just satisfy what feels right in the moment. But this is where the Spirit of God comes and intersects. This was just a secular study for our psychology. But when we bring in this into spiritual disciplines about sin and my sinful nature and living a life that's honorable to God, do I understand that my nature wants what it wants? <laughs> but this is where Paul tells us again and again, Jesus tells us we need to die to our nature. We, we need to take on the nature of God, the nature and the characteristics of Christ. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want my life even spiritually and in my spiritual life and as I, I bring the gospel forward to people to be mediocre or to just be satisfactory, but I believe that God has called his church for a time where we shine, for a time where we are a pure bride without spot or wrinkle, who are glorifying the name of Jesus, and we're taking the gospel with power to the world around us. And so I want to be one of those kids who is able to resist and wait for what is good and right and honorable in the right times for things in my life. I want to be self-disciplined so that it's his spirit, his character through me. So, so we ask the question, well, how do we do that? What does that look like? What does Paul do? How, do, how does he give instruction and encouragement? And before we go, go much further, I do want to, we spoke about those who are abusing grace in the book of Colossians. But really at the heart of this is to understand to be fully self-controlled, to be fully reliant on the Holy Spirit, we also need to understand grace in its fullness in our life. Because normally I might preach about grace and the cross and tie everything together at the end of a sermon, but, but really when we look at self-control, when we look at any of the fruit of the Spirit, we need to look through the grace lens as well. Me meaning that we have a God who loves us, who, who shows mercy to us. Because uh, I'm not going to ask for, for public confessions right now, but each one of us have probably given in to desires, <laughs> have not been self-controlled at times. But this is where God says, I, I want a humble and a contrite heart, a heart that actually understands and realizes and repentive to say, Lord, I need your grace again. I need your mercy. Because I wasn't self-controlled. I wasn't disciplined. But Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. God, may I be able to honor you as you're creating me, making me become more like you. But the scary thing is, or the sad thing is, that so many times in our walk in Christian faith, we say, well, I messed up. I gave in, I wasn't self-controlled, and so we begin to believe these lies of the enemy. We begin to live in a very hostile place where the enemy loves to have a seat at our table. He, he loves to come and he loves to get us to the place where we say, you're never going to be self-controlled, you're never going to be joyful, you're never going to be peaceful. I'm just, you're just who you are, just stay where you're at. Don't desire the deeper things of God, don't, don't invite him to take you farther than you are right now. And this is the where the enemy's greatest lie is in the church, is just saying, well, this is who you are. But what I read in the gospel, what I see in grace is, this is who I am, but this is who he's making me to be. This is who I'm becoming. And day by day, surrendering each circumstance, each new temptation, I bring those thoughts, I bring those desires into submission to Christ Jesus. I offer them to him and I say, Lord, you have your will, you have your way. Make in me, Lord God, a life that honors you. And so we need to understand grace. We need to understand that there are times where we will fall short. Everyone sins, everyone falls short, but we also need to understand grace the grace, that he does not want to see us stay there, wallow in it, and remain in any place of, des of despair. So even though I have failed at times, I am not a failure. E even though I stumble and the enemy tries to keep me down, Jesus is always picking me up. He's always bringing me into a place where he, he just wants a humble, repentive heart who says, Lord, let, let me be more like you. 
And so Paul writes this in Romans 6, 1, because I, we also don't want to abuse grace. Paul writes this. He says, well, what shall I say then? Shall we go on sinning so that may grace increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And we see this understanding that, that we are given grace upon grace upon grace but yet we are warned, we are encouraged, we are shown in Scripture that we cannot abuse that. We cannot come to a mindset where we just say, well, I'll just live however I feel like. But no, we are to be disciplined. And that's, that's where we're going today is self-discipline. Not self-determination, but spirit-filled living. And the gospel, the grace, is that you can't do it on your own. This is why Jesus had to come. This is why grace is sufficient. This is why he poured out his life on a cross for us. Because through history, from the very beginning in Genesis, Adam and Eve, we see very quickly, self-control was out the window. <laughs> they, they were tempted. They were given the opportunity to do what was right or to honor their flesh. And they gave in to the temptation. In Galatians 5, again, we've looked at this verse, but not just the fruit of the Spirit, but we look at verse 16 and 17 again. Because we see this throughout the Gospels. We see this throughout Paul's writing. He says in verse 16, he says, So walk by the Spirit. You ask the question, how can I be self-disciplined? How can I have self-control? Walk by the Spirit, and you will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit, and the spirit is what's contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. But you are to not do whatever you want. He, he makes it pretty clear that there is a battle for our soul. There is a battle that rages for your soul, for your attention, for your allegiance. And we're either going to be a master to one thing, and we're going to love one and we're going to hate the other. And there's this battle that's going on, this conflict in our soul that our sinful nature and the spiritual nature are at conflict with one another. But this is where we need the Spirit of God who is perfect and pure and holy and righteous and good to come and create in me, move in me, live in me. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. But as we see this, well, I think we can all attest that this is indicative to our experience. We, we all feel this. We know those times. We know when, when we're torn back and forth, when we feel that tug of war. And it tr seems true that there are two forces, that our spirit wants one thing and our sinful nature wants another. And it's repeated in Scripture in Romans 7. He talks about the war in our minds. In James 4, James is writing and he's saying, why are there quarrels and fights among you? They come from the evil desires that wage war within you, he says. And so we have to understand that Satan is fighting for our soul, meaning, meaning the stakes are huge. And self-control is about becoming more and more like Christ in our war against evil. But, but that's something that I have come to know, and so have you, I trust and I pray, is that it's worth surrendering to him. It, it is worth the fight. Even though the battle rages for my soul, I know that he is greater. I know that he overcomes. I know that his spirit within me makes me more than I can be. And so when I surrender to him and I say, I'm in allegiance to you, God, I'm going to win. I'm going to be victorious. I am more than a conqueror. And so let's look into 1 Corinthians 9 verse 24 to 27, and this is where Paul is writing, and I love his imagery. Last week we talked about a horse and giving reins to him. Today, as we look at this, let's think in our minds for a moment about Olympics, the Olympic athletes, and about athletes who, who are training themselves and training for, for their goal. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 to 27, we ask, well, how do I come into this right understanding? How do I discipline myself? And Paul writes this very nicely. He says, Do you not know that in a race, all runners run, but only one gets the prize? So run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last 
forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave. Sorry, I just realized I have the wrong one up there. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. What Paul is saying is that we run with purpose in every step being intentional to, to mind the weeds we talked about last week, to make room for the Holy Spirit to do a work in our lives. What, what Paul is saying is, you know these Olympic athletes. What I love is that he can draw off an example that we still can see today in sports, in something that we discipline ourselves to. We, we see these athletes and we cheer them on. We, we see the excitement of when they cross that line, when they, when they win the medals, when, when they are victorious. But little of us know, or little do we think about how much discipline, how much training, how much intentional giving up and sacrifice went into winning those medals, went, went into becoming able to run the race with endurance. And what Paul is saying is that your life as a believer, your life cannot just be haphazard, but be intentional, discipline yourself, make patterns and habits in your life that will increase and give you the stability, give you the motivation, allow the room for the Holy Spirit to move in your life. Paul, Paul is talking, he says, I'm not just swinging aimlessly, I'm not just running aimlessly, I'm not just shadow boxing and beating the air but I have a purpose, I have a goal, I have the directive in my eyes, and my heart, that I'm doing this for a purpose. And what I love is in verse 27, it says, no, I strike a blow to my body, and I make it my slave, so that after I preach to others, I myself may not be disqualified for the prize. He understands discipline. Being a disciple of Christ means that I can't just do what I want to do. If we truly come and surrender to Christ, then, when, then that is just indicative of the relationship we have. We take up our cross daily. We die to our nature. And I know that this is the tough part. This is the crossroads that so many of us come to. Is it worth it? Is it worth giving full surrender to Him? Is it willing... Is it worth dying to myself? It is. It is. And I can't just tell you that, but you need to come to that understanding, that surrender, that submission in your own heart, in your own life, to bow a knee before a living God, but know and to trust that His ways are good, His ways are perfect, His ways are so much deeper and further and richer than anything I could possibly know. But I need to understand and set my eyes, set my heart, set my motivation on Him. And another part that I'll finish off with today are three things. That self-control we touched on is not just about me. Sometimes we live in such an individualistic, selfish life that, that I think, well, I need to be self-controlled so I don't give in to my sinful nature for my sake. But what, what if we began to see that self-control is about you and I living together? That, that when I live in self-discipline, it's not just about Nathan living righteously before the Lord, but it actually helps me honor my kids. It helps me honor my wife. I live in such a way that, that suddenly my relationships, my health, my friendships, my, my pastoring, your ministries to the world around you, it matters. And being self-disciplined, being able to be self-controlled by the Spirit of God actually impacts others. They, they, they will be reflective and hurt and wounded sometimes if I, do, if I give in to my nature. It's not just about me, it's about us. This is where the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit is for the common good. We do it, number one, for the sake of the gospel. That is what Paul was saying in Colossians to the Colossian church. He is saying that we run this race, we have a mission, we have a purpose in our life, that it's actually about 
Jesus' name going forth with power. If I was living just for myself, then that's a pretty shallow existence. But if I understand that I am called, I am given the responsibility, given the authority, given the Holy Spirit to bring forth the message of God to this world, it actually gives me something greater to live for. Suddenly in my days when, I, when I'm tempted, when I come against times where I can give in to my sinful desires, suddenly it gives me this wider perspective. Wait a second, I, there's something bigger out there. Well, there's something bigger that I live for. So in Corinthians 9, a spirit-filled Christian absolutely pursues healthy spirituality. Just like an Olympic athlete, they understand, if I want to win the prize... I can't be eating McDonald's every day. If I I need to discipline myself, go through regimens, put myself into training. That comes with our prayer life, our spiritual life, our our entertainment life, what we allow to come into our lives to be self-controlled by the Spirit of God. The second aspect, as I said, is about others. Self-control is about others. We look back into Galatians in chapter 5. Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit, and then he ends with self-control. But then if we keep reading, if we flip the page, go into the next chapter, chapter 6, he begins right away by saying this. He he says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. And then he gives us a warning and an encouragement that he understands that we, we have a sinful nature. He says, but watch yourself or you may also be tempted. He, he says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you may fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something, that's a pretty sobering thing. Thanks, Paul, for that. If I think that I'm anything, if I think I'm something when I'm not, then I deceive myself. What he is saying is that, that this self-control, being self-controlled is about restoring others, helping others, blessing others, as well as being self-controlled for my own life's sake. It's about others. It's about self-control so that others may prosper. Others may be able to go forward. So we carry each other's burdens that way fulfilling the law of Christ. We we need to understand that our life, our, our discipline is about not just feelings, not about what I feel like doing, but about faithfulness. Worldly self-control, the purpose of that self-control is just to do what feels good or will benefit me. I need to be self-controlled in my diet so that I don't eat too much cake so that I'm healthier. But it really comes back to my selfishness to what would benefit me. But godly self-control, spirit-empowered self-control focuses upon what's good for the common good. What what is the best for each of us? If I'm self-controlled in my purity then I can be a more honorable husband. I can be a more integral pastor. (laughs) My self-control is about bringing health to others as well as myself. So we honor God and we honor those around us and we are faithfully and righteously self-controlled. We we serve our children better. We we control our money. We have self-control so that that we can bless others. We can be more generous We're self-controlled with my pride, so I represent Christ better to non-believers. I'm self-controlled with my anger. We've talked about gentleness and and goodness and kindness. I'm self-controlled with my anger so that I can have healthy relationships with other people and honor people and that people are not afraid to come to me or talk to me or be around me. I'm self-controlled with my time so that I can actually serve others with, with my time and with what God has given me. I can volunteer, I can not just be a consumer, but I can be a, an edifier and a blesser. Self-control is about us, about him being honored, for us to become more like him so we're serving one another. I look at Jesus' life, his self-discipline, his self-control. Do you know how sacrificial he lived his life? <laughs> There are many times I think of that, like in the natural, if he was walking in the flesh, walking naturally, then then when people were flocking to him, asking for miracles, asking for help, asking for aid, he probably wouldn't want to sacrifice that much. But he did because he understood it's about the world around him, not about his desires. 
Would we understand that self-control is about living a life that is honorable and worthy of the call that God has given us? And that is my prayer and my hope that as a church, we begin to understand, we begin to invite the Holy Spirit, show me your plans for my life. Give me, Lord God, the Show me how I can honor you, the gifts that you've given me, the, the desires that you've given me so that I may honor you. Finally today, self-control demonstrates faithfulness in our life. We have established that self-control is not our natural disposition. It's not natural or our nature. And then this is where the Spirit of God comes is that faithfulness. This faithfulness to endure even when it gets hard, to persevere even when it doesn't seem like it's worth it, to devote ourselves and to remain true to the call that God has on our life even when we don't see all the results. And the lie and the trap that the enemy has lulled us into, sadly for many people and many churches, is that following Jesus, resisting sin, and pursuing righteousness should feel good all the time and make me happy all the time. It is fills me with joy. It fills me with purpose. It fills me with life. But sometimes it is hard work. It is hard to resist. It is hard to discipline myself. But it is so imperative. It is so worth it. And so I know that sometimes this is maybe not the most encouraging thing to hear, but to be a disciple of Christ means that I need to be disciplined we do not hide, we do not run, we do not flee from, from the, the weight of what it means to live righteously. But it's worth it. It makes it sound like it's a heavy, heavy thing. But when we look at the glory of God, Jesus being magnified, his, his power going forth, people's lives being changed, people coming into right relationship with him, being freed from the sin that so easily entangles us, sometimes the shame and the guilt and the pain and the hurt from our past, being able to see people walk in relationship with a living God and have life and life to the full, it's worth the discipline. It's worth the sacrifice. So self-control is imperative to our faithfulness to God. Hebrews 12 verse 3 to 5 says this, and this is a scripture that as I was reading, it really kind of hit me. Because in no way do I resist how it's explained here. Let's read it together. It says, consider him, Jesus. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that they will not grow weary and lose heart. You, you wonder, how, how do I keep going? How do I keep self-motivated? How do I stay strong? Consider him. Consider the one who, who took on our sin and our guilt and our shame. Put, put our lives in perspective of what Jesus did for us. And we will not grow weary and lose heart. He goes on to say, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. That, that's so true. It's so true for my life. In my struggle to resist sin, I give up so easily. <laughs> Sometimes I just, oh, wow, it's getting tough. And so we, we have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. It is one of those things like Jesus is talking about, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you, then cut it off. It's one of these things. Do we understand the, how responsible it is on us to, to be in right relationship with God? When temptation comes our way, do I actually fight? Do I actually give a... a fighting effort to resist the temptation. And what I see in Scripture and where we're going with the fruit of the Spirit is it's not about me. The biggest thing I can do is surrender right away and say, Lord, I am being tempted. Lord God, you come and give me your strength, give me your power, give me the fruit of the Spirit so I can have self-control to remain and to stand firm. Paul says that over and over, stand firm, stand firm. Verse 5 says, And you have completely forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses 
You as a father addresses his son. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Discipline. Don't lose heart. Don't get discouraged because you might have missed the mark. Don't, don't get discouraged because the Spirit of God is actually convicting you and stirring your heart and saying enough is enough and you need to break off these things that have easily entangled you or something, a habit that's been in your life for so long. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. Don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't lose heart when He rebukes you. We need to understand that He is a good Father. He, he disciplines those that He loves. And so instead of me resisting and fighting Him and saying, no, you have no access, you have no ability to change my heart, it's so much easier when I just say, yes, Father. Yes, I bow my knee to you. Your ways are greater. And that is faith. That is faithfulness. That, that is endurance. That is standing firm and having self-control even when we don't feel like it. So this war against sin in our lives, we wage war against sin, we remain faithful to God. Even, it says, at the point where it can cost you your life. We, we haven't struggled with sin. We haven't fought against sin. We haven't resisted the devil to, to the point of shedding blood, it says. Have we fought the good fight? I know that this isn't very popular, comfortable preaching sometimes in 2023, but you can take it up with the author of the book. Not me. Remember what Jesus says. He says, you know that there is a road that you could go down. There's a wide road. There's a broad road that many go on, but it leads to destruction. He says, come to the narrow road. It brings life. He says, go on the narrow road. Very few people will find it and get on that road that leads to life. So when it comes to self-control, the, the motivation in my heart is, number one, self-control is to fulfill God's mission in my life. Number two is to serve others. And number three, it is to exercise faithfulness in, in my relationship with Christ. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And uh, as I said, we're, we're going next week is going to be our final message in this series before, believe it or not, we're going into Advent season and into speaking about the uh, Christmas and into um, the glory of God brought in flesh. But as we finish today, in the next couple minutes, what I want us to do is not even necessarily just focus on self-control, even though that was the topic today. But I want to give space, and I want to give invitation, and I want to give room today to spend a couple of minutes. The worship team is going to sing a song called I Surrender. And as we do, sing along if you want, but, but I also want this to just be a space that we don't just rush out of this place. We don't just rush and say, well, I was touched or convicted or the Holy Spirit began to stir something in my heart. But we actually do a little bit of business with God. When we actually come to a place where I say, it's time, it's time to surrender. It's time to see that I don't like the reflection of myself and my gentleness and my goodness and my peace and my joy. It, the way that I conduct myself is not looking like who God wants me to become. And I want to give some space as we sing this song to just be honest before God. The altars are open, but yet, even in this time, I want to have a time where you just ask God those simple questions. Lord, search me, know me. See, see if there's anything in me that displeases you. We talked on it last week. Maybe there are weeds and things that need to be pulled out of our lives to make room for the healthy growth that he wants to do. Let, let's not flee. Just like we ended with that scripture, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't lose heart when he rebukes you. And if you're in that place, because I was in that place this week preparing this message, that there are things I need to bring before the Lord. Things that I need to honestly say to him, Lord, make me healthier. Help me know how to honor you more. But the worst thing we can do is just hear messages, be hearers, and then 
run off and do nothing about it. Don't just be hearers of the word, but apply it to our lives. So worship team, lead us. And as we do, that, that is the prayer, is to allow God in, invite him, maybe not even talking the whole time, but just listening to the spirit of God, confessing to him, walking out of this place with, with a renewed, refreshed spirit. Inviting the Holy Spirit, if you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, if you want more of the Holy Spirit, you want more of Him, just seek Him. He is faithful. He is good. Let me pray and then the worship team will take it. Lord God, we thank You. We praise You, Lord God. You are good. You are righteous. Holy Spirit, I thank You that You Show us all of these characteristics through the life of Jesus, through the character of God. Lord, as I, as I want to know, how can I be more gentle or loving or kind or self-controlled? I look to you. Holy Spirit, as you promise, lead us into all truth. Teach us, Lord God, the heart of the Father. Lord, may I not resist you. May I not resist your discipline in my life, even though it hurts sometimes, even though... It means that I'm going to have to change. God, may I see, like Paul says, that, that in that, in the discipline, there's something greater. I'm running for a crown. I'm running for something, Lord God, that is worth the endurance. The God be, you be with us today. Just move in this place in the next few moments. In Jesus' name. <laughs>
Yes, Lord God, is as we go through these things, Lord God, as we invite you, Holy Spirit, to have your way. God, may that truly be the posture of our heart, Lord God. Here I am. Lord God, I surrender to you again. Lord Jesus, I pray that you just break through, Lord God, the hardness that sometimes we have in our hearts, Lord God, to resist. I pray, Lord God, that you soften our hearts with the oil of heaven, Lord God. Come, Holy Spirit, and move in power. Lord, that we understand, Lord, this isn't out of some some obligation, Lord God, but it's out of a desire of our heart, Lord God, because we were created in your image, Lord God, and you want us, Lord God, to to become more like you, Lord, for your name's sake. Lord God, because you see the fuller picture of our lives, of our existence, Lord God, you see, Lord, that we were put here by accident. Lord God, you have a purpose and a reason and something greater, Lord God, than we settle for. So Holy Spirit, may you move in power. God, as we continue to look into your word next week, Lord God, there is no measure to what you want to do. There is no measure, Lord God, to what you can do in our lives. God, may we go and enter into a season, Lord, that that suddenly we begin to see the fruit of the Spirit developing in our lives. And my hope, my prayer, Lord God, that months from now, a year from now, Lord, as we look back, will we can't believe the work that your Holy Spirit did. God, nothing we did in our strength, not by our might, not by our power, but by your Spirit, says the Lord. Lord God, we pray in Jesus' name. Lord God, just be with every person as we go about our lives, Lord God. As things come our way, Lord God, even as we leave from this place, Lord, May you give us your Holy Spirit, fresh and new, Lord God. Give us new perspective, new lens, Lord God, a new way, Lord, that suddenly we see ourselves as you see us. Lord God, the things of guilt and shame, Lord God, I pray that by your grace, we know that we are forgiven, that, Lord God, that as we repent and we're truly, Lord God, brought to a place of repentance, Lord God, that we do not default back to where we were, but, Lord, we fix our eyes, we set our eyes, on you. Will we understand, Lord God, a new, bright perspective, Lord God, of the fight before us, Lord God, but with endurance. We, we do it, Lord God, to win the prize. We do it, Lord God, for the sake of others, for your name's sake, so that your gospel might go forth with power. Lord, be with us today as we sit around the tables, as we fellowship today, Lord God. May your Holy Spirit just be present. Lord God, may the fruit of the Spirit just abound, Lord God, and may we just enjoy one another's company. May we enjoy, Lord God, your presence. Lord, throughout this week, until we meet again, may you be glorified, may you be honored, may each decision as we wake up in the morning, Lord God, we surrender to you. God, we thank you. In your precious and holy name, amen. Amen. I do want to invite you, if you're newer with us today. We do have a fellowship lunch down the hall. Uh, you can find some tables and um, just invite you to stay and get to know people who maybe you may not normally sit with. And we just encourage you to know a face, know a name, know a story, and to uh, get to know one, each other, one another in a greater way. God bless you.